my thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you. On the 8th of June, 1968, Americans paid tribute to a remarkable politician, the younger brother of former President John F. Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy, had been assassinated three days earlier in the back room of a Los Angeles hotel. Sirhan Bishara Sirhan was arrested at the scene of the crime in what the Los Angeles Police Department, the LAPD, thought was an open and shut case. We're trying to prove that there was a travesty of justice in 1969 at Sir Han's trial. We're trying to prove that there was no way that he could have shot the senator, let alone killed the senator. My main job right now is putting the truth together that Sir Han did not shoot Robert Kennedy, the second gunman did. If you look at him, he came to America in the late 50s as a, as a child, as a refugee um, from Palestine. Um, he had quite a tough life growing up, and then suddenly he's in the spotlight as the assassin of Robert Kennedy without remembering anything that happened that night. Kennedy had authorized the selling of bombers to Israel. And that incensed him because he was from Palestine and he felt the Palestinians were getting a bad rap. That's what his lawyers argued in the trial, that he was so upset at that that he kind of snapped and went into a self-induced trance and, and killed Kennedy in a you know moment of rage. I believe that Sirhan was a gentle person. He had never done a violent thing in his life. When he saw Kennedy speak at an earlier event, he said Kennedy looked like a saint to him. And it's like this was a man whose politics really lined up with Sir Hans. So it is a weird break for him to suddenly turn around and want to kill the guy who really is more sympathetic to his cause than any other politician on the American scene. Sir Hans Sir Han had no criminal record before Robert Kennedy's assassination. He wasn't involved in any political activity and the Palestinian cause had no real traction in the U.S. at that time, despite the 1967 war. I would think, in terms of a case like this, properly looking into it, and properly looking at a guy who's still in prison, Lee Harvey Oswald obviously was killed two days after the JFK assassination. James Earl Ray, the alleged killer of Martin Luther King, he died in the late 90s. So CERN is still with us. Why not investigate his case properly um, while there's still time and we can do some, something about it? In 2017, U.S. President Donald Trump ordered the release of all documents relating to the assassination of John F. Kennedy 
Robert Kennedy's older brother, in 1963. These files had remained classified since 1964. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested in Dallas, but was shot dead two days later live on TV, and so never went to trial. Sirhan Sirhan was arrested at the scene of Robert Kennedy's shooting and sentenced to death in April 1969 commuted to life imprisonment three years later. But since the 1970s, commentators and eyewitnesses have called for a new investigation. And in 2012, the senator's son, Robert Kennedy Jr., wrote to the Attorney General asking for new evidence to be considered in the case. Al Jazeera has now examined the different theories about the assassination and the reasons behind calls for a new investigation into the conviction of Sirhan nearly 50 years ago. Quite right that a lot of evidence was destroyed. A lot of evidence was destroyed. Scandalous, horrendous. In a case, in, a, in any murder case, to destroy evidence the way they did was just, just horrendous. You know, I can't speak for the LAPD and why, you know, they didn't do a better job investigating the case, why they destroyed some evidence, I don't know. All the evidence was destroyed after the trial. But they had a legal obligation to save the evidence because Sir Han was going to file an appeal, or his attorneys were. So that evidence, under the law, should have been preserved for the next, for the appeal. And according to the LA Police Department, they just didn't have the space to store it. Several commentators and witnesses have said that the LAPD lost or hid evidence, or that there was a second gunman. Books have been written and different conspiracy theories examined. Documents have gone missing and people have died, taking their evidence with them. Al Jazeera has gone back to the events of the 5th of June 1968 and heard from eyewitnesses and from journalists who've looked into the case for 10 years. It's also examined audio and visual evidence which may not have been given enough credence at the time. It's not possible to return to the actual scene of the crime. The Ambassador Hotel was demolished in 2006 and the Robert F. Kennedy Community Schools opened on the site in 2010. The schools and memorials now stand near where Robert Kennedy was assassinated on the evening of the 5th of June, 1968. he just won the primary election to be the California Democratic Party's nomination for a U.S. president. There was a last-minute decision to take a back route out from the main hall through a small kitchen where he was shot. I saw Sirhan prior to the senator coming down. When I first saw him, I thought he was another dishwasher. Uh, that person uh, didn't seem unusual to me. Uh, he didn't uh, appear out of the ordinary. He was just sort of making small talk with me, asking me, how long do you think the speech is going to last? Is it almost over? And I just said, I don't know. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Uh, he finished his speech. I could hear the applause. 
And then I saw him and his entourage begin walking toward me. The first time I saw Sirhan as we entered the room where there was a tray stacker here, which was six to eight inches above the ground. Sirhan was not a very tall person, so he was standing on top of that. There were a bunch of trays, but you could still stand on it. So he could see above everybody, and he could see as the senator was progressing. Bob was moving on at that point, so I was about six feet behind. The senator would have been to my left, and I would have been almost parallel to him, uh, walking toward the colonial room. I was mainly probably about two steps ahead of Senator Kennedy at that time. I was standing literally within three feet of the senator. Carl was pulling Senator Kennedy, I believe, by his left hand which made it awkward for the senator because he was shaking with his right hand and Carl was grabbing his left, pulling him this way. Vincent DiPiero was very near to Kennedy when he was shot, but his testimony differs from the other eyewitnesses. So Bob was shaking hands and after, after he came in, I followed him in. He started shaking hands with Jesus Perez and, and, uh, uh, and Juan Romero. Romero was a hotel worker in the crush of people around Kennedy as he moved through the kitchen. I was able to shake his hand. Then he took a, uh, a step forward, took a step, a step and a half. And I saw Sirhan with the gun in his hand coming up around Carl Euchre, and as he came up, he was his hand was outstretched, totally outstretched. Eyewitnesses say that Sirhan raised his right hand, holding an Ivor Johnson Cadet 22 caliber revolver pointed at Kennedy. They say Sirhan fired two shots. <laughs> When I heard the first pop or shot, which I believe was a shot, at first I thought it was a firecracker. I turned toward my left. At that point, I saw Sir Hans or Han immediately to my left, no one between he and myself, holding a gun, shooting into the crowd, the crowd of people, shooting into the direction where I had last seen Senator Kennedy. Carl Eucher, he's a terrific witness. He was there closest of anybody. He said Sir Han came, the gun was close to his face. Sir Han got two shots off and he grabbed him and put the hand down on the steam table and Sir Han continued to fire the gun. First it was bang, bang, and then and then uh, I, I looked back over there and there were there were uh, a commotion going on. And then I heard the other, the rest of the shot. And that's when witnesses told the police, we heard two shots, a pause, and then a flurry of shots. And that's pretty much what I heard, too. An Ivor Johnson Cadet 22 can hold up to eight bullets. So after firing the first two shots, Sirhan had six left. And he kept robot-like pulling the trigger until he fired the other six shots. But he had no control over it, and the bullets went all over the place. After the shooting, he was surrounded by about 20 people that were trying to kill him. Um, that's why, I mean, he was in custody by all these guys until the police arrived. The suspect is in our custody now. Uh, we do not know who he is. He had no identification. He refuses to make a statement of any kind. 
he does speak and understand English. The gun is in our custody. It's a 22 caliber, eight shot, and all eight shots were expended. According to the LAPD report, one bullet went through Kennedy's coat without penetrating his body. It scratched Paul Schrade's head as he stood right behind Kennedy. The police found that bullet at the crime scene. I got shot, not knowing I had been shot. I thought I was being electrocuted the way I was sh uh, shaking when I went down. And so I didn't see Bob got shot. Got shot. Uh, actually, he didn't at that point. Another bullet hit Robert Kennedy behind his right ear, and that was the fatal shot. One more hit him under his right armpit and exited through the top of his shoulder. That bullet allegedly hit the ceiling, but the police never found it. A fourth bullet also hit Kennedy under his right armpit and settled in his spine under his neck. So that was four bullets. Sirhan had four more remaining. A fifth bullet hit Ira Goldstein in his left thigh and lodged there. And a sixth bullet hit Erwin Stroll in his left leg. A seventh bullet hit William Weisel in the stomach and remained there. According to the police reports, the eighth and final bullet was fired at the ceiling bouncing back and hitting Elizabeth Evans in the head. The police found this bullet as well. First two bullets, shooting, uh, missing Kennedy, shooting me, the one two in uh, going westward to Goldstein, two shots, one through his pant leg and one th into his butt, one in Stroll's leg and one into uh, Evans' forehead. That's seven bullets out of an eight-shot revolver. How could he have shot Robert Kennedy four times? On top of Schrade's point, evidence offered by two FBI investigators, William Bailey and Duane Wolfer, needs taking into account. Bailey and Wolfer attended the crime scene as soon as the assassination took place. They discovered two more bullets that were not mentioned in the LAPD report. The next day, William Bailey, an FBI agent at the scene, is, in front, is on the front page of all the newspapers pointing at a, a door frame. And in 1976, he gave a, a sworn statement that he saw two bullet holes in that door frame. If a second gun is not firing, there cannot be any bullet holes in the wooden door frames. So the police take those door frames down and they bring them to the police station to do work on them. It turns out there are too many, these bullets represent too many bullets. Sirhan's gun holds eight bullets. More recent forensic analysis also supports the view that more bullets were fired at the scene than Sirhan could have had in his gun but the LAPD does not appear to have taken that on board. Then in 2005, further evidence. Kennedy's victory speech in the main hall of the hotel was recorded by a Polish journalist, Stanislaw Przynski. When Kennedy's group took the back route out, Przynski followed them, but inadvertently carried on recording. This distorted audio was recorded just outside the kitchen. It's a very poor quality recording, which meant for many years people didn't really analyze it properly. So it was only when Phil Van Prague came along and started analyzing it in 2005 that um, you know, he made a number of very interesting discoveries. Um, the, the most important of which were the 13 shot sounds on the recording. Uh, and there were two instances of double shots, which means two shots fired so close together they couldn't have come from the same gun. The only way you can explain it is that there was a second gunman in a position behind Kennedy where 
the, the prosecution never proved that Sirhan was behind Kennedy or was able to shoot him point blank. Thomas Noguchi was the chief medical examiner and coroner for Los Angeles County and performed the autopsy on Robert Kennedy. He submitted a detailed report on the bullets that hit Kennedy. This is that report and the evidence he gave in court. Gunshot wound number one, direction right to left, slightly back to front, upward. Gunshot wound number two, entry right axillary region, direction right to left, back to front, upward. Gunshot wound number three, direction right to left, back to front, upward. The autopsy report is probably the most decisive evidence that Sirhan physically could not have shot the senator. They've got three shots into the senator, one shot went through his shoulder pad. All came from behind the senator at point uh, range, all shot from the right side at an upward angle between 30 and 35 degrees. Which meant that the shooter was actually kneeling down behind Robert Kennedy when he was firing his gun. However, None of the eyewitnesses said that Sirhan was low down. Furthermore, Thomas Noguchi's report said that the muzzle of the gun that fired the shot that killed Kennedy was a maximum of three inches or seven centimeters away from him. At powder burn range, now, so your viewers understand what powder burn range is. It means the gun was pressed strongly up against either the, the body or in case of the fatal shot, just went about an inch behind the ear. Carl Eucher, he said he saw Sirhan coming at him, came very close to him, and that gun, Sirhan's gun was two feet from Kennedy. Not Sirhan being two feet, but Sir Han's gun being two feet. And that was confirmed by Ed Menezi and another assistant maitre d' who was right behind uh, them at that point. So, there were different eyewitness accounts of where Sir Han was when he shot Kennedy, his distance from the senator, the number of bullets fired, and the coroner's report. Well, either Noguchi is wrong or the eyewitnesses that said he was two feet away are wrong. And yet more evidence emerged to cast doubt on the safety of Sir Han's conviction. And then bullets were swapped, and then evidence was destroyed. I, you can't make up something like this. Senator Robert Kennedy was fatally shot on the 5th of June, 1968, after winning the California nomination to be the Democratic candidate for president. A Jordanian-Palestinian, Sirhan Sirhan, was tried and jailed for his murder. But since the 1970s, there have been calls for a new investigation based on differing eyewitness accounts, the number of shots fired, and distance of Sirhan from Kennedy when he fired. There seem to be particular discrepancies between eyewitness Vincent DiPiero's testimony and the report of Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and Coroner Thomas Noguchi. The gun itself was maybe three or four inches from the head, but Sirhan was about three, approximately three feet away. I mean, you know, I didn't measure it, uh, but it was an estimate. But the court record of Vincent DiPiero's testimony says, I saw those two go off, and after the second one, I couldn't see because I had blood all over my face. The police had a lot of witnesses that said Sirhan was standing four, five, six feet in front of Bobby Kennedy, and uh, that didn't quite match up with what Noguchi found. Well, either Noguchi is wrong or the eyewitnesses that said he was two feet away are wrong. Stay back, please. Movie cameras captured scenes in the kitchen immediately after the assassination. But arguably the most significant pictures were taken by an amateur photographer and Kennedy follower. There was a, uh, a teenager, Scott Enyard, in the pantry that night. He had a 36 millimeter camera. 
He had a roll of film in there for 36 exposures. He was taking pictures. Anyart took pictures before, during, and after the assassination. The Los Angeles police, the LAPD, took his camera and film to their labs. They later returned pictures to Enyard, but only those taken before and after the assassination. Those Enyard took during the assassination were never returned. What happened to those photos? Why didn't the defense team ask? They knew, never asked for them. The number of bullets found, the angles they'd been shot from, and Yard's disappearing photos, all combined to cast reasonable doubt as to whether Sirhan was the only gunman. In their investigation, the LAPD also reported that the type of bullets fired was compatible with Sirhan's gun. And then they say, we can prove this because the bullet in, in Kennedy's shoulder matched the Sirhan gun. And they were wrong about that. But they were, they were lying about that as well. They say the bullet that went into his head, which is a fragment, tiny fragment, nearly the whole bullet, they say that matched the Sirhan gun too. We saw striations on that fragment which is crazy because there are no striations on that fragment. They can't prove it, but that's what they did before the, before the jury. They even lied about that. Paul Schrade, Lisa Pease, and Laurie Dusek all cast doubt on the police findings. Because they couldn't match the bullets to Sirhan's gun, the bullets were switched so that a match could be made. And the problem was, they couldn't use Sirhan's gun to make matching bullets because Sirhan's gun had been given to the grand jury. And then bullets were swapped, and then evidence was destroyed. I, you can't make up something like this. Medical examiner Thomas Noguchi was never asked to identify the bullets. He always maintained that the fatal shot was fired at close range, while most eyewitnesses said Sirhan was further away. There is a suspicion that it was that it was substituted, and that he he would have revealed that. At first, there was a a, a movement to try to discredit Noguchi, uh, and that he say that he had done an incompetent um, autopsy. Well, that didn't work because Noguchi refused to step down and 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 said he would fight them in court. Once they realized they were going to have a fight with the coroner, they switched positions and now said. Oh, well, Tom Noguchi uh, said that the bullets were fired from an inch away, so it must be all the witnesses that were wrong. So they, they switched horses in the middle of the race. You know, they got rid of him. He was not going to play ball their way because he's an honest man. And he called things the way he saw them. And uh, he was very, very upset with the whole, in my view, with all the way the proceedings went. The question remained as to the number of bullets fired at the scene, but also as to why the LAPD didn't question anyone other than Sirhan as potential suspects. The police didn't follow any of the leads that, that uh, would point to a second gun. No one has seen the second shooter. We have no eyewitnesses for that. How is that possible? Right there, closed space, everybody there. All these eyewitnesses that are so reliable when it comes to describing what Sirhan did, suddenly failed to be reliable for the second shooter who's right there, two inches away from him. Everyone missed that? St. Eugene Caesar was on the door. He was on different doors, but uh, right before the shooting, he was on the, the, the door leading into the kitchen pantry area. He followed Kennedy in, which he was not supposed to do. It was against orders from, from the uh, person who uh, uh, was supervising the guards for the, for the for the hotel. He was supposed to stay away. One is the security guard who was standing behind Senator Kennedy to his right, which is where the shots came from. 
and he did have his gun drawn that night. And he also did own a 22 caliber pistol with the same uh, rifling characteristics as her hands gun. Many researchers believe that Fane Caesar shot Kennedy. He was certainly in the right position. He was close enough. I don't think that he, he shot the senator, uh, but I think he might have seen something. He has been the traditional suspect. Uh, I'm not convinced that he was the gunman, but um, he certainly is worth scrutiny. Two other figures were seen in or near the kitchen. One, Michael Wayne, was initially detained, but then released. He was later seen leaving the hotel with a girl wearing a polka dot dress. The other suspect is a taller, a dark skinned man uh, who resembled Sirhan in some respects, but was taller than he was, who was seen in the pantry um, and then seen in the pantry with the gun. And earlier he'd been in the pantry and this, Sirhan and this man were looking at each other. Um, that man was seen with a gun, and there's at least one witness that said he saw that man shooting at Kennedy from behind. And that man was seen running from the pantry with the gun, and then was seen running uh, away uh, with the girl in the polka dot dress down the stairs and out through the parking lot. But was the girl in the polka dot dress Kennedy campaign worker Valerie Schult, or Elaine Neal, whose husband claimed to have worked for the CIA. You have Sandy Serrano, who saw the polka dot dress, girl, and this guy coming down the stairways. And the girl in the polka dot dress is saying, we shot him, we shot him. And Serrano looks at him and she goes, who did you shoot? And she said, we shot Senator Kennedy, and runs off into the darkness of the back side of the hotel. These people knew Kennedy had been shot before anyone around them had known Kennedy had been shot. Okay, the polka dot address, the woman in the polka dot address, uh, and any other anomaly you want to find in any particular event of, of epic proportions like this, somebody famous, a big political uh, event like an assassination, there are going to be lots of little anomalies that become pregnant with meaning because we're looking for something meaningful and you can always find something that sticks out that no one knows has any idea. Who was that person? The woman in the polka dot dress? Who knows? Who knows? Pro probably nothing. This woman spent the day with a local chemical salesman who was at the ambassador to sell them chemicals for the hotel. She was afraid and she was looking for help, for somebody to help her get a passport to get out of the country the next day. She predicted the killing with accuracy. She said, they're going to take care of Mr. Kennedy tonight at the winning reception. That's a prediction hours before the, the event occurred. At his parole hearing in March 2011, Sir Hans Sirhan's account of events was generally quite clear until the actual moment of the shooting. I, I, I remember wanting to drink and to get some coffee because I just wanted to make sure that when I drove home that I would there, there's no chance that I could. So remember that part of it? Yes, I remember. You remember that. wanting to get some coffee yes. prior to the shooting? Yes. So what do you remember next? I, I remember being uh, being uh, tackled by the people there, uh -huh. and they almost choked me to death. Believe right. or not. And uh, I yeah. wish they had, because this this thing would. Well, have, that wouldn't have been right either. I didn't see Bobby Kennedy uh, down. I didn't know what what really transpired because they had me on the table, and I think that I came to or began began to. To, to, to feel, to, to sense what was going on. So and what would you sense? When they, when they were choking, yeah. you know, and they were saying, don't kill him, or something like that. So you uh, heard that. And I, I, I remember some, some words like that. Okay, and, and what did and you think had happened? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what the hell happened. He, he legitimately 
did not remember those critical moments. In 2011, Sirhan Sirhan's defense team consulted hypnosis expert Dr. Daniel P. Brown to test the theory that he may have been hypnotized to carry out the Kennedy assassination. We had Dr. Brown from Harvard spend over 70 hours with Sirhan. He is one of the world's leading experts on uh, mind control and conditioning. And Dan Brown, after all this time with Sirhan, is of the mind that he was clearly programmed. About 10, 5, 10% of the population is just naturally highly hypnotic. They can enter trance states, block out feelings. And so he clearly was one of these people. Sirhan Sirhan's defense team used the hypnosis theory as the basis of his final federal appeal in 2013. But the court rejected the appeal, with the judge calling the psychological test results, quote, of negligible weight. He said they were intriguing, but fell short of, quote, demonstrating that Sirhan was subjected to mind control. One other detail of the assassination should not be overlooked. The last minute decision to change the route taken by Kennedy out of the main hall. He was asked to go to the press room through the back kitchen. But who knew about the change of plan? Did Sir Han? I don't know how, how, I, uh, how anybody knew that, because, uh, like you said, uh, uh, nobody knew what was the plan. It was changed at the last minute. It's important to try to understand all the facts related to why he went into the pantry. You know, is it, was it just a coincidence that he went there? I think not. Uh, only because uh, coincidences that lead to assassinations of this sort are, in my view, very suspect. Who made that decision and why? What explains Sir Han's presence there? Was there enough security? Was Sir Han working with another individual? There were a lot of election parties that night, and he went to one of them at a different location. Uh, and then, you know, once that party was finished, you know, somebody there told him, "Hey, there's a big party down at the ambassador. Do you want to do you want to check it out?" So he went down there to to, to check it out, um, and then he went back to his car and apparently he got his gun and he went back uh, in search of coffee to the hotel. How was Sirhan able to get into the pantry with a gun? That's an excellent question. Because there were two ace guards, one at each end, who were supposed to be making sure that only people who were credentialed with Kennedy credentials were allowed into the kitchen. So how did Sirhan get past them? Well, you know, the obvious answer is maybe he had helpers. Maybe there was somebody who took him in and said, he's with me. Maybe it was somebody with a PT-109 pin. Sir Han Sir Han's defense attorney was the Los Angeles criminal lawyer Grant B. Cooper. The basis of the defense case that Cooper argued was that Sir Han had committed the crime because he was mentally ill and that he had acted alone. Cooper was criticized at the time for the way he dealt with Sir Han's personal writings being used by the prosecution in court. That notebook should not have been allowed into evidence at the trial because it was taken from the house without a search warrant. And the defense team never raised that issue. They should have hired a private uh, handwriting expert to look into that. There have been many obstacles in the way, uh, mainly his own defense counsel, frankly, early on. Early on, Grant Cooper agreed to all the prosecution's motive. This is a scandal. How this could be allowed to proceed it, in a court of law is a scandal. But it did. It was his lawyer told, the, told the, uh, the jury right at the outset, we're not going to try to prove his innocence. 
We believe he's guilty. This is defense counsel. We believe he's, we just want, we're here to try to save his life. Sirhan Sirhan's defense faced other problems. There have been suggestions that pressure was put on some eyewitnesses to change their stories, as in the case of Sandra Serrano. This audio recording was released long after the trial, along with other documents as late as 1988. She just reported to the police what she saw, and yet they treated her like a criminal. After weeks of bullying her, finally she gave up and said, I don't know what I saw. I testified under oath and on lie detector test that I saw the polka dot dress. And he says, no, you never saw this girl. And he kept drilling into my head that I was wrong, that I didn't see anyone, that I didn't see anyone. I was off the, the uh, lie detector. He turned it off, and he was saying, look, you didn't see the girl in the polka dot dress. Why he wanted me to do, agree to that, I do not know. But I did see the girl with the polka dot dress, which was Valerie Schulte, which I did identify in court. They were battering the, to change the story. In, in, ta in, in phase tape of Hank Hernandez doing this interrogation, he himself says, you put in words in my mouth. Part, part of the problem with police investigations is they too are subject to cognitive biases. They think, we know who did it, and we're only going to pursue this particular case. We don't care about all this other stuff. They narrow their focus down to like one person they think that did it. And then, you know, so this goes in support of your case that, well, maybe they're ignoring, you know, somebody else that might have been relevant to the case. Yes, that does happen. You don't need to have everybody involved in it. All you need is the one man that is controlling the investigation because he decides who's going to be interviewed, what's going to be buried, what is going to be fabricated, and they did it. I sympathize with Sirhan Basharik, Sirhan, that he took the rap unfairly, unjustly, and dishonestly on the, on the part of the prosecution. And that story has to be told. We have a very strong case based upon not theory, not conspiracies, but based upon the prosecution's own hard evidence, which they tried to destroy a lot of it, but they, some of it they didn't destroy. And that's gonna be useful. he should have been eligible for parole in 1980. And he should be released. He meets all the qualifications under the California parole. And we have a Palestinian assassin with all, all that means to American voters and to the pol politicians who would weigh, you know, um, would weigh their decision making in terms of whether they really want to alienate the Jewish uh, voters in America or whatever by, by uh, support, be seen to support a Palestinian assassin. I actually don't believe Sirhan understood the role he was playing. I truly believe from years, 25 years of research, that Sirhan had been hypnotized by others who wanted to use him as a pawn in their plot. It's just a question of not giving up. Once you get involved and you see injustice prevailing, you still stay on until you try to. Do as much as you can. At some point, you may have to say, that's it, I can do no more. And uh, James Earl Ray died in prison. Sirhan Sirhan is in prison. And if we're not successful, then he will also die in prison. Sirhan Sirhan was convicted on the 17th of April, 1969. His death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment three years later. 
Defense lawyers have been trying to get him a new trial since 1994, but have so far failed. Sirhan has a parole hearing every five years. This was his 14th in March 2011, and parole was denied again in 2016. The public outpouring of grief at Robert Kennedy's death was a sign that they had lost a principled politician. A senator from New York who cared about poverty in the South and racial segregation everywhere. Even if the case is reopened, the exact truth of what happened over 50 years ago may now never be 